Our message this morning is from Ecclesiastes chapter 2. Ecclesiastes chapter 2, picking up in verses 18 to 26. And if you've um, been here at the same time as I have, you know that I've been working my way slowly through Ecclesiastes. We've come to the last part of the second chapter, verses 18 to 26, and the title is Cheerful and Sober Use of Worldly Things. And so now let us hear from God's Word, verses 18 to 26. Yea, I hated all my labor, which I had taken under the sun, because I should leave it unto the man that shall be after me. And who knoweth whether he shall be a wise man or a fool? Yet shall he have rule over all my labor wherein I have labored, and wherein I have showed myself wise under the sun. This is also vanity. Therefore I went about to cause my heart to despair of all the labor which I took under the sun. For there is a man whose labor is in wisdom and in knowledge and in equity, yet to a man that hath not labored therein shall he leave it for his portion. This also is vanity and a great evil. For what, what hath man of all his labor and of the vexation of his heart wherein he hath labored under the sun? For all his days are sorrows and his travail grief. Yea, his heart taketh not rest in the night. This is also vanity. There is nothing better for a man than, it, than that he should eat and drink and that he should make his soul Enjoy good in his labor. This also I saw that it is that it was from the hand of God. For who can eat, or who else can hasten hereunto, more than I? For God giveth to a man that is good in his sight, wisdom and knowledge and joy. But to the sinner he giveth travail to gather and to, be, and to heap up, that he may give it to him that is good before God. This also is vanity and vexation of spirit. Well, if you were uh, with us, you'll remember in the last message, I put the question to you uh, from the last passage about hating your life, even as Solomon said, therefore I hated my life. And even as Christ told his disciples to hate their own life, I asked you, do you hate your life? Or are you still in love with the present world and still hoping to glean those things from the present world that are not found therein, that are not in the present world. Uh, lasting satisfaction, uh, lasting fulfillment. And I asked you that. Well, we're going to consider that some more in this passage. You see, the heart hates to give up the, the pleasures of the world. Young people, especially, will, will dream about all the things that they're going to do in their lives. And, and they'll dream about the things they want to enjoy and experience in the world. And this will be before their eyes very much as they think about their lives, uh, what pleasures they might have and what things they might enjoy in the world, uh, very, very much. And then older people, older people will become very accustomed to the pleasures and the indulgences and the enjoyments that they, they have in their lives, that they've come, they've come very accustomed to, and they could not imagine their lives without it. And so you see, the heart loves the pleasures of the world, the heart hates to be confronted with what Solomon is, is describing in this chapter. If you remember last time I said, this is the message that the powers of the world do not want you to hear. They do not want you to know what Solomon is telling you here, that it's all for naught. It's all vanity. It's all empty. Because the heart, the heart hates this message. The heart loves pleasure. The flesh loves pleasure. And so this is why the heart needs to be instructed. And this is why messages like this are so vital. Why else do you think Solomon goes on at such length? He knows how evil and twisted the heart is. And he knows that the temptations are everywhere. And he's seen it. He's seen the wreckage of people who have foolishly gone after sinful pleasures, even speaking of himself. He's seen the chaos and the frustration and the wreckage in his own heart as his heart has guided him this way and that way, and he's, 
He's used wisdom to see it, it's a dead end. It's, it's not going to deliver what it's promised. And so this is why he says, all is vanity. All is vexation of spirit under the sun. And so I would ask you, do you really believe him? Do you really understand that deep down? It's, it's difficult to say because what Solomon is claiming here is, is very, very intense. It's very great. And so we'll look at what he's saying in this passage under three headings. First, he will speak of contempt for wasted labor. So he'll speak of his contempt that he has for wastefulness. Then he'll speak on the right use of the things of the earth. How would we use them in a, in a proper way? And then he'll speak on the sinful and destructive use of earthly things, worldly things, and, and the pitfall there. It's like when Solomon admitted earlier in this book that, that wisdom excels folly. He said, wisdom, wisdom excels folly as, as light excels darkness. Solomon will admit that there are uses for the world's good. Uh, of course there are. You see, because God made us to labor God made us to have needs and to attend to those needs. He, he, he gave things to us. He gave us the earth. And he even invites us to enjoy them. Enjoy these things. And we'll see that. He, he invites us to enjoy them, but yet in a, so, in a sober way. And not in, in a frenzy of, of just focusing on these things and just desiring more and craving more and, and trying to get as much as possible and, and squeezing whatever we can out of the things of this world. He did not, he did not give us the things of the earth for that purpose, but he did give them to us to enjoy in a sober way. And this is what we'll see as we go through these pass this passage with the Lord's help. We start with a contempt for wasted labor, a contempt for wasted labor here in, in these verses beginning uh, in verse uh, 18. Solomon has, has lamented this already. He's lamented this in previous sections of his book, uh, and he goes on he here and he's saying it disgusts him how much is wasted in this world. It's like a problem that, that no man can solve. All the waste, all the futility. It's like I said earlier, it's like a, a, a foundation that's been cracked and it's sunk. And what do men do? They, they keep on trying to build on it. They just keep right on and trying to build on it. Uh, nevertheless, ne you know, not, not even... Uh, worrying that it's it's broken and it's cracked and, and nothing will stand on it. And so it, it disturbs Solomon, all this waste and all this futility. And you can see that as a mark of wisdom. Does waste bother you? Are you bothered deep down by just wasted time, uh, wasted effort, wasted words, vain words? Are you bothered by that or are you fine with it? You know, sometimes we'll say things or, or others will say things like, oh, I'm going to just go and kill, kill some time. You ever heard that before? I'm just going to kill some time. And, and, you, and if we're thinking like Solomon, we'll say, seriously, just kill time. That's a vexation of spirit. You see, God has given us these things to use for a purpose. And, and for us to just say, oh, it doesn't matter. I'm just going to kill it. I'm just going to wish it away like it's a nuisance. You see, that would, be, that would be distasteful for us if we're thinking like Solomon, because Solomon hates waste. God hates waste. And so it's a, a mark of wisdom to be vexed by a hatred of, of waste in the world. And, he's, and he considers his own labors. He says the total of his own labors. It may all end up in waste. He doesn't know. And in these verses, he asks some rhetorical questions about what will happen when he's gone. Verse 18 and 19, he says, Yea, I hated all my labor, which I had taken under the sun, because I should leave it unto the man that shall be after me. And who knoweth whether he shall be a wise man or a fool? Yet he shall have rule over all my labor, wherein I have labored, and wherein I have showed myself wise under the sun. This is also vanity. Well, some commenters have uh, suggested that Solomon is giving some voice to maybe some misgivings he might have about his own son, Rehoboam, uh, who would actually turn out to be quite foolish and make a, a wreckage of the kingdom with a great blunder 
And so maybe Solomon's perceiving that and he's giving some voice to his misgivings about his own son. But Solomon's questions here are very justified because no man, no one can be assured that their lifetime of work will be uh, preserved and used well and go to good, good purpose. No one can be assured of that. No one can be sure that it will not be wasted entirely. And so this made Solomon bothered. It made him disgusted. And he says in verse 20 that he caused his heart to despair because it bothered him so deeply. And so look for a moment from the perspective that Solomon is, is adopting in, in this book. I've asked you this before. Look, look at the perspective that Solomon is, is adopting of a view of life on the surface, a view of life under the sun. And you'll see that, that if you think that this present life is all that matters and the building up of kingdoms and the building up of legacies and the building up of goods and possessions, if you think that's all that matters, then this would bother you to the core. This would be a greatly distressing thought to you. Imagine trying to build something and the whole time that you're building it, you have this, this very high probability that it's all going to be ruined. And it won't last for even more than a day after you finish it. Uh, like maybe somebody rebuilding a classic car and they're working on it and uh, they spend years. They're going through every piece of it, you know, front to back. They're going through every piece of it, meticulously restoring everything. They're taking, you know, pleasure in it. They're, they're trying to restore this classic car. They're trying to uh, track down rare parts and expensive parts. And they put years, they put time, they put energy, they put effort into it. But the whole time they're thinking, what's going to happen to this car? Maybe I'll drive it for a little bit, but I'm not going to last that long. And then I'm going to pass it on to someone else. Maybe they're going to be a fool. Maybe they're going to be a fool. Maybe they don't know how to drive a car like this. Maybe they're going to crash it. You know, wouldn't that be a vexation to you? Wouldn't that be a, a bother to you? And this is what Solomon is, is beginning to feel, and it disturbs him, it disgusts him. And he goes on, uh, he presses his point in verses 21 to 23, and he's showing it's not only a problem for him, it's actually a problem for everyone. It's a problem for all people. He says it in, in verses 21 to 22. For there is a man whose labor is in wisdom and in knowledge and in equity, yet to a man that hath not labored therein shall he leave it for his portion, this also is vanity and a great evil. For what hath man of all his labor and of the vexation of his heart, wherein he hath labored under the sun? And so Solomon is pressing his point. He's saying it's the case for everyone. Uh, this is why all of us, all men should be deeply disturbed if we're thinking of, of life through that perspective that Solomon is presenting to us of under the sun. It should disturb all men. And, and men are disturbed about these things. Men, they build great empires and they say, I don't know who's going to take care of it. I don't know who's, who I'm going to leave it to. My son is a fool. You know, my, my employees are fools. They don't know who they're going to leave it to and they just gonna, they're just watching it crumble in front of them. And you know, you could take it even down to the more uh, micro level. You could take it down to a day-to-day -day level and say that this is true for all of our work and all of our labor, every one of us. Uh, whatever work we're doing, whatever we're, we're building towards, none of us know if it's going to last. None of us know what's going to become of it, especially after we are gone. And it's a great evil. It's a great evil. Solomon describes the frustration so well in uh, verse 23. He says, For all his days are sorrows, and his travail grief. Yea, his heart taketh not rest in the night. This is also vanity. And so describing the frustration that exists under the sun. For all those that, that would labor and toil, you don't know what's going to happen to it. it. It keeps you up at night. All the world of work and labor, building the kingdoms of men, and, and it's, it's a losing battle when you stop and think about it. It's so much so that men's hearts can't take rest at night if they're thinking about it as Solomon is. It breaks their hearts, and they're lying awake at night, and they're asking themselves questions like, what am I spending my life on? Is it all really worth it? 
What's it going to amount to amount to? Why am I putting myself through such grief if it's just going to slip through my fingers? What's it all for? What's it all for? These are good questions for us to ask. These are good questions for the world to ask, but, but not, not very many are asking these questions. You see, God made man to be more than just an animal. God made man to ask these questions. That's why Solomon says in, in later in chapter 3, uh, when he's talking about uh, the seasons and the time for this, the time for that, Solomon will say, God has set the world in men's hearts, but that no man can find out what God is doing from beginning to end. So you see, it's good to ask these questions. Men have a longing to see the purpose of everything but they're not granted that. We'll only see a a narrow slice. And so we'll have these questions and it will keep us up at night and we'll wonder what we're doing. What's it leading to? What's it all amount to? You know, those that are outside of the church who don't know the word of God, they might be asking the question, uh, what's the purpose of life? You know, what's it all for? And they might be kept up at night like that because they don't know They don't know what's going to happen. They don't know why. They don't know what it's all for. It's like a low-income worker. Think about a low-income worker in today's economy. We all know how how hard it is in today's economy. A low-income worker that tries just to make ends meet, but they can't do it. And so they take on other jobs, but they just can't quite get to that point of sustaining themselves. And you know, there's drudgery in that, and there's oppression in that, and there's this this feeling of of being trapped in that. And so you can imagine someone laying awake at night in that situation, feeling totally trapped. What else can I do? I've tried it all, and I'm not I'm not getting to where I need to get. And so they're they're trapped in that. Now now take that and apply that feeling to anyone, or whatever their situation. And you can see that that, that would be the feeling that Solomon is, is, is describing, someone who feels trapped in, in meaninglessness and not understanding what, what's the purpose, what's the point. You know, the low-income worker, all they're trying to do is, is, is get over that hump, get over that hill, but it's the same for anyone because anyone would ask, what's the payoff? What is this leading to? When will, when will I have that fulfillment and that satisfaction? I'm just, it's just eluding me. I'm just chasing it, and it's, it's never within my grasp. Because of these things that Solomon is bringing up to us, uh, the, the hatred of waste. You see, Psalm 127 describes it also. When it says, it's vain to rise up, or to uh, rise up early, or to stay up late, you know, tossing and turning on the bed. It's vain to do these things for the toil of this life and to feed on sorrow's bread. And then it says, the Lord gives his beloved sleep. The Lord comes and, and answers all of those frustrations and all of those, those cares and those those. Uh, feelings of, of uh, helplessness and trap and the, those trap feelings. He answers all those things. And this brings us into our second point. What would be the right use of worldly things? Life is so uncertain. Life is full of such waste. And so does this mean that all working and all gathering and all storing up is just waste? Why even do it? Let's just, let's just live like tribesmen. Let's just pick our, our berries and, and, hunt our food. Let's just live like tribesmen. Is that what it's, it's describing? Is that what this is leading to? No. Solomon says there is a right use of the things of the world. He says it in verse 24. He says, there is nothing better for a man that he should eat and drink and that he should make his soul enjoy good in his labor. This also I saw that it was from the hand of God. And so in these verses, Solomon is acknowledging a right and a proper use, a right and a proper attitude that we could have about the worldly things that we 
gain and gather. It's not a defeatist statement. It's not just saying, you know, it, there's no point to anything, so just do whatever you want. It doesn't matter. Like a eat, drink, be merry, for tomorrow we die. It's not a defeatist statement. Uh, Paul uses that actually in 1 Corinthians 15. If after the manner of men I have fought with the beast of Ephesus, what advantage is it to me if the dead rise not? Let us eat and drink, for tomorrow we die. So that would be the defeatist statement, but Solomon is not saying that. Solomon is saying that it is a gift and it is a good to eat and to drink the things that we gain from our labor because it's from the hand of God. And God gives it graciously and God gives it mercifully. And so it is good that we would make use of it. Now, a little later, Solomon is going to say that God gives to man what is good in his sight, wisdom, knowledge, and joy. And so we see that the things of the world are not bad in and of themselves. In and of themselves, just consider on their own, they're not bad. We're not Gnostics. We don't believe that there's just evil inherent in the physical objects of the world and the things of the world. It, they're not evil on their own. And so we don't need to do that and attribute evil to these things. We don't need to take notes from the ascetics. Uh, boys and girls, maybe you've ever heard about the ascetics, the monks. Uh, sometimes they're called hermits. Maybe you've heard about these monks, the hermits. And they thought that the path of true holiness is to just shun everything that's material, anything that's physical, just shun it all. Don't enjoy any of it. And go out in the wilderness and just live in a cave. And people maybe will come visit them and bring them you know, a crust of bread or uh, something, uh, you know, something to eat out in the wilderness. And they'll become these frail men and you can see their bones sticking out through their uh, skin. And they say, this is the right way to shun all of this, to escape uh, what Paul or what, what Solomon is saying. Uh, there are stories about these monks. Uh, some of them are called stylites because they would climb up on the top of these stone pillars and live on the top of a pillar just open to the elements, and people would just hoist up a little bit of food to them. And they said, this is the way. This is the way to correct for all the evil that Solomon is pointing out. This is the way to make a great application of what John says in one of his letters. He says, love not the world, nor the things in the world. And they said, this is the way. This is how we do it. But does that really line up with what Solomon is saying? Because Solomon is saying right here, it is good for a man to eat and drink. It is good for him to gather. It is good for him to enjoy good in his labor as a gift from God. But the difference is, it's a sober enjoyment. It's not a frenzied enjoyment of how can I get as much as I can? How can I gather as much as I can and hold on to it and make sure it's mine and make sure that it gets to somewhere good after me. It's nothing like that. It's just a sober enjoyment. Uh, later in chapter 5, he's going to revisit this in, in, in Ecclesiastes, and he's going to say in chapter 5, Behold, that which I have seen, it is good and comely for one to eat and to drink, and to enjoy the good of all his labor that he taketh under the sun all the days of his life, which God giveth him. For it is his portion. Every man also to whom God hath given riches and wealth, and hath given him power to eat thereof, and to take his portion, and to rejoice in his labor. This is the gift of God. And so, becoming like a hermit monk or a stylite monk, it's not lining up with what Solomon is saying. Because the things of this earth, uh, even as we read in, in Proverbs 27, given by God for enjoyment and for use in a proper way, a proper and a sober way. And so Solomon is talking about a right attitude for the blessings that God gives in this life and seeing them for what they are. They're necessary. They're, uh, they're abundant. God has given us abundant blessings on this earth. It's a gift for God to be enjoyed in a sober way. This is not defeatist, like eat and drink and be merry for tomorrow we die. It's not, one of the, it's not a radical reaction. It's not unbridled indulgence and, and a frenzied gathering. This is 
eat and drink and enjoy what God has provided in a sober and a thankful way. See, Christ also gives assurance to his disciples that God will see to their physical needs in this life in an abundant way. God, you know, Christ says, will not, will not God richly clothe you and feed you if he clothes the, uh, clothes the lilies in such a way upon the mountains? And if he feeds the bird, will not he abundantly give you, to these, thi- give you these things? Uh, Christ himself teaches his disciples when they pray, give us this day our daily bread. You know, the larger catechism unpacks that a little bit for us. Uh, when it does the question and answer 193, it unpacks that for us. What do we pray for in the fourth petition, which is, give us this day our daily bread? Answer. We pray for ourselves and others that both they and we, waiting upon the providence of God from day to day, in the use of lawful means, may of his free gift and to his fatherly wisdom shall seem best, enjoy a competent portion of of them, and have the same continued and blessed unto us in our holy and comfortable use of them, and contentment in them. And so do you hear the unpacking of that and the wisdom of that in in the larger catechism? Because it says we are to pray for a competent portion. Whatever is fitting in the eyes of God for us. Whatever is fitting. And, it, and further, it says, we're to enjoy them. We're to, to make use of them and to be content in them in a sober way. And so we're to pray for a competent portion. Uh, I hope all of this is, is painting a picture for you of how we would use the world's things, the earth's things, in a sober way with thankfulness. Then there's also Paul. And what does he say to the Philippians? This is very familiar. Chapter 4 to the Philippians, he says... I know both how to be abased and how to, how to abound. Now, we focus a lot on the part we, that he says, I know how to be abased, and I know how to suffer want, and I know how to, you know, he, we focus a lot about that. But don't forget, he also says, I know how to abound. I know how to abound. Everywhere in all things, I am instructed both to be full and to be hungry. Both to abound and to suffer need, I can do all things which Christ, uh, through Christ, which, which strengtheneth me. So Paul didn't say, I know how to be abased and I know how to shun all ab- abundance. I know how to get out of ever being blessed with anything, anything more than just the bare necessities. He doesn't say that. He says, I know how to be abased and I know how to abound. I've learned how to abound with thankfulness with sobriety and with moderation and the fear of the Lord. And so the question would be, do you know how to abound like Paul and like Solomon is is driving here? Uh, Do you know how to abound? So parents, think of it like maybe you're giving your children a treat. Maybe you're giving them uh, a really nice uh, ice cream treat. How would you want them to respond? It's pretty simple. Would you want them to respond with, with grumbling? and say, this is it? This is all I get? I wanted, I wanted twice this much. Or would you want them to just gobble it up really quickly and say, uh, where's more? I want more. Or would you want them to refuse it and say, I'm not worthy of this. I haven't, I haven't been a good boy or girl. I'm not worthy of this. Would you want that? No. You wouldn't want any of those things. If you were bringing a, a, a treat to your children, you know exactly what you would want them to do. You would want them to receive it with thankfulness and and with cheerfulness and to enjoy it with sobriety. Not being greedy, not being gluttonous, not being unthankful, but receive it with, with sobriety. Now, this is just how the Lord is with us. This is just how it is. It is His good pleasure to give us all things, all things that he he bestows upon us. It's his good pleasure. And how does he want us to receive it? With thankfulness and use it with sobriety. 
And then we'll actually enjoy them. And they won't, they won't turn into, into a curse for us. Because if we can't enjoy them with sobriety, it'll be a curse. Which brings us to our third heading here. The sinful use of worldly things. This is what Solomon brings us to in verse 26. He says this, For God giveth to a man that is good in his sight, wisdom and knowledge and joy, but to the sinner he giveth travail, to gather and to heap up, that he may give, it, give to him that is good before God. This also is vanity and vexation of spirit. So Solomon is considering something here that God could give two different men the same thing, okay? Uh, Think about this, that he could give two different men the very same thing, uh, advantages, uh, blessings, earthly blessings, material benefits, the same thing. And one man who is wise can receive it from God and, and enjoy these things from God as God intended and not become caught up in uh you know, desiring more, wanting more, uh, becoming greedy, becoming gluttonous, not get caught up in any of that, but just be thankful and just be content. That's one man. But the other man can receive the very same things and then get caught up in the gifts themselves, put his eyes upon the gifts of uh, themselves and saying, I want more. This isn't enough for me. I need to gather more. I need to exert myself. I need to, to bring it all into myself. I need to go go into this mad frenzy of of getting more and more and more until my soul is filled with these things. It's like the rich man in uh, Luke chapter 12 who tore down his barns and he built other barns and he said to his soul, soul, take thy ease and uh, be content with all of these things. Uh, This is the fool. This is not sobriety. This is like being intoxicated with the love of the things of the world. And this is a sinful use. And and this is a person that's not wise and they can't handle it. And so what does Solomon say? God's going to take that person's things and and remove them from him and give it to somebody who is wise. Uh, William Perkins, a Puritan pastor, he, he comments on this. He says, the Israelites in the wilderness were not content with manna, but would needs have flesh to eat. And God gave them their desire, but while the flesh was in their mouths, his wrath fell upon them. Therefore, let us lust after no more than God gives us, uh, gives upon our sober use of lawful means, lest in seeking more, we draw God's curse upon us. But alas, few are content with their estate. The yeoman will be like the gentleman in his attire and his diet. And the gentleman, like the nobleman, and hence comes usury, oppression, injustice, and much ungodliness. And so he's saying very few are content with what God's God's portion is in this life. And he's saying that the yeoman, like the common man, will want to be like the gentleman. And the gentleman will want to be like the nobleman. We're always going to want to be like the next step up. We're going to always strive to to cling and to to gather up those things which would advance us in this world and in this life. That is what the heart loves. And that is not sobriety. That is not sobriety. You know, in my my regular work and in my teaching, I was teaching my students about uh, Karl Marx and the communist uh, movement begun by Karl Marx, who is a materialist and an atheist. Uh, and his philosophies and his writings. And I was teaching them that Marx was bothered that there were, there were all these common workers and they had so little, but then there were these middle class and these upper class and they, they had a lot. And they weren't doing the same hard labor that the, the regular workers were doing. And so what was his solution? His solution was to, to drive ungratefulness into the hearts of the workers. And that's what, that's what communism is all about. It's about fueling covetousness and fueling greed and dissatisfaction to the point of, of revolution and violence and death and murder. And so that was what Marx's solution was. Uh, we need more greed. We need more covetousness. And then 
everyone will have an equal portion. And you see, Marx had no patience for religion, and he actually hated it. Uh, he actually despised religion because religion, because the Bible teaches men to be grateful, to be thankful for what God gives them. And so that's why Marx had no patience for it. Uh, he, he taught that it should be completely eradicated. Uh, he wanted to make religion, he wanted to make thankfulness to God a laughingstock. But you see, God has made him a laughingstock. A laughing and now he is, is con uh, condemned uh, from every corner across the earth. Well, most of them. The common denominator in the sinful use of, of the world's things is, is not being thankful. And that's what I would have you see. The common denominator is, is not being thankful. Paul, he includes a condemnation of being unthankful when he's warning Timothy. When he says, I would have you know, Timothy, that in these last times, men shall be lovers of their own selves. Covetous, boasters, proud, blasphemers, disobedient, uh, disobedient to parents, unthankful and unholy. And so you see, he includes unthankful in all that list of, of uh, warning about what men will be in, in the last times. Even now we see it, unthankful. And then also Paul includes this in Romans 1 when he's speaking of uh, the great evil, the great sinfulness of, of natural man. He says in Romans 1, because that when they knew God, they glorified him not as God, neither were thankful, but became vain in their imaginations and their foolish heart was darkened. You see how glorifying God and being, and being truly thankful is like a defense. It's like a safeguard against slipping and sliding into darkness and, and uh, vain imaginations and idolatry and all those things. So being thankful from the heart and truly grateful for the things that God provides for us, it's like a shield. It's like a safeguard. Imagine sitting down to eat a meal and being nourished by the good things of the earth that God has provided. He provided the soil, the seed, the rain, the sun. He provided the farmer, the trucker, and the grocer, and the, and the butcher, and everything to, to create this meal. And imagine sitting down to it and just chowing down and not even being thankful to God who has given all of that. But this is, this is so many people. This is our world. Not thankful. And so not being thankful, that is the common denominator. That is the, uh, the point upon this warning of using the world's things in a sinful way. Well, we've really only scratched the surface of everything that the Lord has been bringing to us through, through Solomon. You see, Solomon comes out strongly once again to tell us how we should be, we should be vexed, we should be disgusted, by what we see in the, in the world around us. If we're looking at it from a perspective of under the sun, it doesn't make sense. It is meaningless. It is empty. And he's telling us, he's coming out very strongly. He's telling us, be vexed about these things. And so, so why does he do this so much? And why do I keep on preaching this to you, the same thing again and again? It's because the heart still loves the things of the world so much. And the heart is still drawn after the things of the earth, so, so much and so strongly. And so this has to be preached again and again. And we have to hear it from Solomon again and again because the flesh will come up with all kinds of reasons to enjoy the things of the earth in a wrong way and to go after the things of the earth and to heap them up and pile them up and, and, and content the soul with the things of the earth. The flesh loves it. The flesh loves to be ministered to in all of these ways and, and the comforts of the world and worldly security and the spiritually diseased heart will be subject to these temptations and will fret about trying to hold on to as much of the world's good as it can and to fret about not being able to hold on to more. That is the spiritually diseased heart. That's the way of misery and despair. And so what we need to do is to tell ourselves that godliness is gain. Repeat it to ourselves from 1 Timothy 6. Godliness is gain. 
All the things of the earth have their place. They may be used cheerfully with thankfulness. They may be used, uh, you know, even with, with contentment and enjoyment. But godliness is gain. That's what we're to remember. Godliness is gain. Spiritual blessings are gain. So much more than the things of the world. You need to see the things of the world as way down here. And godliness and spiritual blessings as, as high as the heavens. That's what we need to do. That's what we need to see. To live is Christ and to die is gain. The person who's obsessed with the things of the world will not say that. They will not think that way. Whoever's obsessed with the world will not say to die is gain. No, because the person obsessed with the things of the world will say to die is game over. To die is to lose it all. No, no. The person whose mind is is right will say to die is gain. To be with Christ. To leave the world behind. Good things in the world may be used with thankfulness, cheerfulness, sobriety. I am thankful for good things in this world. I am very thankful. I'm not opposed to using them. But as Paul says to the Philippians, he says, let your moderation be known to all men. And so as we draw to a close, some practical considerations here. Do not let it be thought of you that you are all about gathering up as much as you can of the world's goods and enjoying them in a, in a uh, frenzied way and living it up. That is not... That is not the right countenance for a believer to have. That you want to just live it up and forget uh, forget sobriety. Never let it be thought of you. That what you care most about is having the latest and the greatest things. That's what fills your mind, your, your conversation and your speech. No. The things of heaven, the things of the Lord, that's what fills your mind and your speech. Never let it be thought of you that you just thrill in just gathering up things and just using them for your own lusts and for, uh, you know, just going from another one high to another high to another high. This is what James condemns when he says, ye lust and ye have not, ye kill, ye desire to have, ye cannot, ye cannot obtain, ye fight and ye war, yet ye have not, because ye ask not, ye ask and receive not, because ye ask amiss, that ye may consume it, upon your lusts. What are you asking for? What are you all about? What are you seeking? Just more of the world's things, earthly things that you can use them upon your lust? Whatever you're asking for to to be used in this world, let it be with thankfulness and so that God may be served. What is man's chief end? The chief end of man is to glorify God and to enjoy him forever. So whatever you ask for in this life, let it be that God may be served and God may be enjoyed and God may be, may be uh, glorified, not that, that you may be increased and ministered to. Never make this world your portion. Like that man in Psalm 17 Uh, David says, deliver me from the men which are thy hand, O Lord, from the men of the world, which have their portion in this life, and whose belly thou fillest with thy hid treasure. They are full of children and leave the rest of their substance to their babes. So their portion is in this life. They're filled with the things of this life. They think about leaving their portion to their children. That's what they think about. Remember what Paul said in Romans 6. We read earlier, you should reckon yourself dead to sin, that sin should not reign in your body, that you should fulfill the lusts thereof. Whoever has their portion in, the life, in, this, in this life, all they're doing is just fulfilling the lusts of this world. And Paul says, consider yourself dead to this world. You know, we're going to go on and live in this world and we're going to have needs. And it's even, as we've said, it's even good that we would enjoy the things that God puts before us. But we're dead to this world. Our thoughts are above. Our hope is above. And you see how all of it connects right back to Solomon. Don't fulfill the lusts of sin by trying to gather and and hold on to the things of this world. 
Learn how to abound like Paul, if that's God's will for you, but with a sober appreciation. And then be like the other man in Psalm 17. David, who says, as for me, I will behold thy face in righteousness. I shall be satisfied when I awake with thy likeness. That's primary. Satisfied to be more like Christ and to be more like God. That's primary. Everything else is a distraction. May the Lord give his blessing to his word. Would you stand with me now as we close in prayer?